Welcome to episode three of Ask Your Scientists, Data Analysis and Proteomics. Where are we and where are we going? Today I'm sitting with Ryan Benz, Senior Director of Data Science, to talk about data analysis tools and methods used in proteomics and other technologies to identify what the challenges are and how data scientists can leverage innovations in other spaces to make innovations with proteomics research tools. Ryan, thanks for being here with me today. Thanks, Shayan. So I'm going to jump right into it. Um, what does data analysis and proteomics currently look like? Well, I think I'll start off by maybe giving a plug to one of the first uh, podcasts that you did. Um, sure. Two of my colleagues, uh, Dan and Margaret, and they did a great job talking about the power and promise of measuring proteomic information. Um, and one of the, the points they brought up was the challenges associated with measuring proteins. And it really starts from the very beginning. It starts with how you design your study, how you collect your samples, um, how you handle and prep them, how you measure them. And all these things can have an important influence on the data that you work with. So as a data scientist, I think it's really important to understand how all these details can have really an important effect on, on the data and maybe the results you derive from them. Um, but with all these challenges also comes the excitement of being able to work with data that can really provide new biological insights and meaning that you might not be able to get through other methods. So it's a really interesting type of data to work with. Um, and also, frankly, there are lots of really interesting problems and challenges that still exist in proteomics. And so it's really a great space uh, for, for innovations. So thinking about those challenges, um, what, what are the challenges, what are the bottlenecks that data scientists, you know, building these tools in proteomics have? Yeah, so one of the main uh, sources of data that I've, I've worked on and that we work on extensively at SEER is data that's derived from mass spectrometry. And, you know, historically in, in proteomics, mass spectrometry has really been an important tool for proteomics because it allows you to measure a huge amount of information in a single experimental run. And so it really is a workhorse in the field. But as you can probably imagine, with obviously this vast amount of information comes lots of complexity and challenges. And so, for example, a mass spec data file can be really large, you know, like several gigabytes a piece or more. And in the early days when we were running relatively small studies, a, you know, a desktop computer was sufficient. You could store and process your data on that with really out too many issues. But now we're asking deeper biological questions. We're running larger studies. And so now simply the logistics of, of dealing with this vast amount of data really can become a bottleneck. And so as a data scientist, you know, that's something that we have to deal with. Um, and, you know, obviously look to other fields as well to help us uh, along those lines. Um, but fortunately, you know, like I said, we have lots of, lots of um, other areas we can look to. Proteomics isn't the only field that has to deal with large amounts of data, so lots of places we can look to. But, you know, this is going to be a challenge that's going to become, you know, increasingly more of an issue as we begin to run larger and larger studies. Mm -hmm. So then um, how do you solve for those challenges? Yeah, so I think um, one of the really important things that has happened in the last decade or so is that we've seen our scientific teams become increasingly interdisciplinary you know, across different different fields. And proteomics is really challenging, as we've you know, talked about. And so I think you really need to look towards bringing a diverse set of people that are bright, that are motivated to, um, you know, help us with these interesting challenges. So like on the data side, you know, we're looking to, you know, bring people in with a uh, uh, background in software development. And this has been really crucial to the field. It's given us software tools and packages that are more robust, um, that can deal with these larger data sets. Um, and so, you know, data, data or software development has been really important there. On the data engineering side, um, you know, like I said, dealing with large amounts of data is something that you don't typically get from a, a typical science education. And so looking to data engineers that know how to handle these large data files, know how to work with resources in the cloud, frankly, is really becoming a necessity in the field. And then maybe a bit more recently, um, we've been looking to people that are experts in machine learning. And we've had some really interesting developments, certainly in the proteomics field, um, you know, in the last several years. And um, lots of interesting and exciting areas and progress to be made there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hear about machine learning being used to solve uh, all sorts of complex problems within many different technological disciplines. Um, for instance, genomics. Um, what are we learning from the innovations in data analysis methods like genomics uh, that can help us with data analysis and proteomics? 
Right. Yeah. I think like uh, most areas of science, we look towards other fields that have encountered similar problems. And genomics is obviously a prime example for us. And many of the methods that are used in genomics data analysis can be applied, at least in part, um, to proteomics analyses. But I think it's really important to understand the specific uh, properties and complexities of the data you're working with. And proteomics data has those. I think it's um, probably not a great idea just to blindly throw a machine learning method at a proteomics data set, um, particularly as we're looking at these models that get, get increasingly complex um, and look almost more like a black box uh, to us um, that could potentially lead, lead us astray. So I think it's really important that we bring our domain knowledge to the problem. We need to you know, use really good machine learning um, and statistical practices, and we need to think about how do we validate the findings? If a machine learning method gives us an answer, um, can we trust that? And that's really important as we think about biology and human health, where, where the answers that we give can have a meaningful impact on, on, on the lives of people. So I think it's really important to think about how we validate our findings from machine learning methods. Um, and also another piece of the, the component here that is challenging in proteomics is there really isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and from the data perspective side, there are lots of different ways a proteomics researcher might collect and process their data. They might use some existing software that's, that exists, or they might choose to write their own software in their own pipelines. And actually, I think that's really cool because it shows that there's a lot of innovations in the field. Um, but it also creates challenges uh, when we think about trying to compare data from different proteomic studies across different labs, different companies, and so on. So that, that is a challenge that exists. Um, and so maybe in the future we might um, you know, start to coalesce around some standard ways in which we process the data. But still, again, there's lots of areas for innovation uh, for people to, to work with their data. Mm -hmm. So if, if all these challenges and all these bottlenecks were solved, um, how would this change the way scientists conduct their proteomics research? Yeah, so at a high level, I think proteomics now is at a really great position to provide really transformative biological insight and meaning. And, you know, the, in the general scientific and tech community, we've seen these amazing advances in hardware and instrumentation and technology. We've seen really great advances in data analysis methods and machine learning. And the cloud now, we, we have access to unfathomable amounts of computational power. And it's really exciting to see all of these things now are sort of coming together um, to help us tackle these, these deeper and more challenging biological problems. And as we look towards the future, um, I think it's really going to be um, important that we combine information from genomics, from proteomics, transcriptomics, all the omics here. Um, I think that'll be really powerful for us to unravel complex biological problems. But as a start, we need to collect the data to do that. We need to learn how to best combine this information. We need to understand what works and doesn't. And we need the data to be able to do that. And at least from the proteomics perspective, I think one key piece will be making proteomics methods more accessible to the general scientific community. We need to smooth over, over some of these roadblocks that make running proteomics experiments challenging. And I think if we can effectively do this, um, groups that are now not using proteomics methods can start to bring these methods in-house and start collecting proteomic information along with the, the other sources of, of, of information they're collecting. I think that'll be really powerful. Well, Ryan, thank you for sitting down with me to uh, discuss data science and proteomics. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been Episode 3 of Ask Your Scientists, Data Analysis and Proteomics. Where are we and where are we going?